today's um, expert call, a panelist call, Peter will be sharing with us some tips and tricks around business. And, um, and he has a lot. I'll let you share a little bit about your background, Peter. Um, but I know that you've had, you've, you've gone through these um, uh, crisis or business, when you call crisis, like business um, ups and downs in 2008. And then um, for 9-11 as well. So it's kind of, you've, you've gone through it and to have persevered and know how to shift. So so let's, start, let's start with that as a, a really good point of differentiation. You called them ups and downs. They should be called lefts and rights. Oh, I love that. Tell me more. Well, if you say to somebody, there's a hill or a valley in front of you, if there's a hill in front of you, then you change the way you walk, right? You start walking with more power and less speed. And if you were walking downhill, you change the speed and you do small little steps. In environments like this, that's a really bad idea. You don't carry on doing what you're doing in a different way. And what I mean by that is there's four tactics when you get a market shift. Right. Tactic one is to hunker down, fire non-essential staff, reduce your overheads, and say, we're going to wait this out. Um, it's a really bad idea because it takes a lot longer than you think it's going to take. You know, Dubai, when I was in um, the Middle East, they had, you know, years after um, the initial kind of property recession crash in 2008, 2012, they had people leaving their cars at the airport to the extent where they put a bucket at the airport saying, please drop your car keys with a note of the parking space so we can find out which one it was. Because they had hundreds a day of people just reaching a point of bankruptcy. So all the people that tried to wait it out weren't successful. Um, or very, very few have to have insanely deep pockets to be able to wait it out. So that's choice one. Choice two is to say, right, now is the time to go harder and faster. If I made 50 calls, I'm now going to make 70 calls. If I spent 1 million, I spent 1.2 million on marketing, whatever numbers you've got. Again, it's a really bad idea because your stimulus has totally changed. So you're responding to a new world in the old way, but more efficiently, which is crazy. If, if you woke up in the desert one day and in mountains the next day, you would change your behavior dramatically to be able to cope with that new environment. Way three is to go, nah, this whole thing, it's all just a, a bunch of propaganda. It's a bunch of fear. We don't need to change anything. I hope I don't need to speak to that too much. Well, way four, which is the only way that seems to work, is to say, okay, this is new. So what is it I have? What's in my toolkit? What do I sell? What are my products? What are my services? Who are my customers? What needs do I satisfy? What is the new world, the new audience, and how do I bring those together? Um, now, I'm not saying that it's not going to involve cutting costs. I'm not saying it's not going to involve going harder and faster in certain areas. It certainly will. But that first point of, of process of, okay, this is different. How do I replan, rework, reaffirm what I do to suit this is such an important thing. And the, I think the word ups and downs negates that thought process. It's, I think it's better saying, okay, literally, you were in the desert, now you're in the mountains. What are you going to do? And you go, okay, all right, fair enough. Um, I'll do X, Y, Z, I'll do ABC. And you see so many examples of it, like one restaurant chain in the UK um, decided to shut down before any of the lockdown, shut down all of its kind of front of house operations, turned its waiters and waitresses into delivery drivers within a mile, canvassed every business within a mile saying, you can get exactly what you used to get from us and we'll deliver it within 15 minutes and it'll be a hands-free delivery. So we'll put it at the door. Um, and then use, and then the, almost in this, and, and have been phenomenally successful. And then right next door to them, a chain that's very, very similar said, we offer a fine dining experience for our guests and patrons. Therefore, we can't possibly continue. Therefore, we're laying off 25 people. So exactly the same stimulus with in almost exactly the same geography and two businesses responded entirely differently. One went, okay, it's game time. Right? If we're going to have this, we can now capture, and I have to be careful when we're talking about the business, the human tragedy is obviously real. It's obviously apparent. And 
it should be respected first and foremost. But if we're just talking about business, that is an, a change is an opportunity. So you can respond to that change however you like, but I would advocate to people, look at your opportunity, look at the, the fact that your market, you know, if people, personal trainers is a great example. If you're used to getting personal training one-on-one, -on -one, well, nobody can do that anymore, which means every single person almost on the planet that is interested in personal training is now looking for remote training. So if you're a personal trainer that goes, oh, my model doesn't work because you know, I need that human contact with people, well, nobody's model works. You're all at the same starting line again. So if you recognize that what you offer is training and you remove the face-to-face -face contact of it, well, you still have a business. And in fact, your market is now probably somewhere in the region of 500 times what it was before. Because you're, as a personal trainer, your, mar your market is what? Two square miles, three square miles, depending on where you live in the, in the world. Now it's seven billion people. Um, so yeah, it's that kind of, okay, what do I need to, what, who do I do, what am I, how do I fix that, how do I go forward with it? And so um, the question is how do, so you have people who have already been online that were online. Now you have people who have their, um, you're looking at people who already have their um, customer, their normal customers that will obviously want to go probably be the first ones I'm assuming to go take it off, um, to take it online. And then what would you say um, would help people differentiate themselves from others that are also every I feel like a lot of people are all going online how what is your advice on that or is it just a um a limiting belief the thought of oh but everybody's going online yeah so I'll answer that kind of in two parts first of all our world is largely controlled or for 1.x billion people a lot of our thought process is, is controlled by what Facebook show you in in an algorithm and Facebook algorithm is designed to show you content that you want to see. Um, and that's not just Facebook, that's, you know, most mass media, so CNN, Fox, et cetera. Most of these sites are designed to say, okay, this person likes this, this, and this, so I'm going to show them more of that. So let's go back to that personal training example, which is such a good example. If you're a personal trainer, when people start doing remote training, those will come up in your feed. So you get a very skewed view of reality by going, wow, everybody is doing personal training online now, so I'm not going to bother. No, just the algorithm is showing you what you want to see. It's not showing you a, a, a clean view. So your data is, is kind of compromised. The biggest answer, and it's very, it sounds very esoteric, but I don't think it is. People get very confused with, with three things inside their business. One is what they sell in comparison to number two, what the customer was buying, in comparison to number three, the mechanism in which that was delivered. And they are different facets. So let's, let's stick, let's not stick with personal training. Let's go to something else to make it interesting. Uh, let's go to life insurance. That's, a, that's a, a great example. I'm just literally trying to pick random things to see, to make sure it all works. Okay. So a life insurance salesman, if you ask a bad or an, a non-enlightened life insurance salesman what they sell, they'll say, I sell life insurance. If you ask a customer what they actually bought, they'd say, I bought peace of mind for my relatives and my family and my friends. And the mechanism that used to be delivered might have been a face-to-face -face consultation. But the important part of all of it is the thing that the customer bought. That's the thing that really matters because that's the thing they're still willing to pay for, which is what you get. I think it's called parallel competition streams or something where the concept that Netflix and Cranium compete with each other. Now they're not in the same market. One is a TV channel or a broadcast network, whatever we're going to call Netflix nowadays. And one is a board game. So how can you say they're com competitors? Well, they compete for the same thing that the person is buying, which is entertainment. That's what's so important to realize is what is the person actually buying? And I love the Netflix example because it dovetails into Netflix versus Blockbuster. 
So Blockbuster actually had the opportunity to buy Netflix for about, I think it was about $10 million. It was a very, very small amount of money and rejected it. And when you, the CEO actually stood up and said, this Netflix thing will never happen because people love coming to the stores. We rent DVDs. So he actually had the belief that what he sold was an in-store experience. That was actually his opinion, that he sold people going to Blockbuster, and he was obviously wrong, and so skewed in his view that he actually felt that people wanted to do that. Whereas what Netflix realized is people wanted an at-home cinema experience. That's what people wanted. And they went, well, we don't need to deliver that in the same way. So they, you know, Love Film started by doing DVDs in the post because it's about reducing that barrier. So Netflix and Blockbuster essentially sold the same thing. But Netflix realized what people were buying was something very different. People were buying an in-home cinema experience. So they then were able to go, what is the best way for us to deliver that? Whereas Blockbuster, because they started with what they're selling instead of what people are buying, looked at the most efficient way for them to deliver what they sold, which is a very different exercise. So if you go across almost every business and ask people, what do you do for a living? They will say, I sell X, Y, Z. And they don't say, I help my customers buy ABC. And that sounds really silly, but if you swap it around, you can look at your business and go, well, hang on a second. I you know, let's take me as a business strategist. I used to sit with people and help them grow their business. That's what I sold. But what they bought was my 20 years of expert advice working with businesses to help them change their business. And the reason, I mean, look at that in this current environment, I'm doing better than I've ever done because I'm no longer selling how I can help people grow their business because that's not relevant right now. But the 20 years of expertise helping people change their business right now is more accurate than it's ever been. So that would be my, my big advice to people is understand what they were buying is different from what you were selling and the mechanism that you deliver it is totally irrelevant. So um, would you say for people to look at, maybe they, they used to say, I do X so, uh, to Y, so I do this, to this customer base, right? And then the actual key would be in order for them to, mm -hmm. right? It's really that's, the a really good way to, that's a good way to start it and then then get rid of all of that and just work on the in order for them to. In order for that, and then focus on that and strategize. And do you have any tips and tricks on how people can become creative? Because a lot of times we're so stuck in our story. We're so used to, we've been doing business the same way for so many years. Like a beautiful example you were giving us as restaurant owners, one restaurant, you know, high-end restaurant decides, takes the chance like, all right, we're delivering it to your door, doing that, or we're closing down because what we do is in person. Um, uh, rest, uh, restaurant service. So do you have advice as to, is it brainstorm or just sitting down, taking some time and just taking the, the result and brainstorming, um, asking some friends, uh, coming on this call and asking you? <laughs> that would be the one I'd... That I'd, would be my option. That's all I go to. Um, yeah, I, I would say the very first part to me is that first acknowledgement. I am now in a different world. Everything I knew does not apply. Throw everything out that you need, that you were thinking about, start with that. And then do, and I, I think this is such a useful exercise across almost every area of your life, do an inventory and go, okay, what are my assets? What, what am I good at? Is it my people? Is it my processes? Is it build it, it doesn't matter, literally put all of your assets down on one side. And then on the other side of the equation, say, okay, my customers, what are their problems? What are their needs? What are their wants? What are their desires? And then the last bit is, and where is my expertise? Okay, so I've got this bunch of assets, I've got this set of needs, and I've got this set of expertise. So given the world as it now stands, how do I deliver on those things? How do I put those together in a model that works? I would say it's a case of brainstorming, whiteboarding, friends, whatever process you're, you're more aligned to, 
So mine is quite destructive. I write stuff down and then cross it out and then rewrite it again and rewrite it again and rewrite it again until I go, okay, that's it. And when I, and I know when I see it and I go, got it, understood it, right, okay, here we go. And then I've got absolute clarity to go after it. And we had an earlier call with the group call, which I thought was amazing. But I'd also say to people, you have to get out of the, um, if you're in a mindset that isn't lending itself to finding that answer, take a break, go for, you know, this, this is not going to go away tomorrow. This is, you've got, you've got a couple of days to work this out. Restock, spend some time with the family. If you can, where you are, go for a walk, whatever it might be to just break your patterns and your molds. So you can look at it with what we used to call in the agency where with soft eyes pretend that you've never seen it before and do it and then come back and pretend you've never seen it before. So you can iterate without ego or emotion. This is not your fault. The situation in, you're in is, was totally unpredictable. You have no blame. The, you, you are literally, it's, a, it's, it's quite liberating if you think about it in some ways as a business owner. If you're presiding over a business that was going broke, it is your fault. You, know, you do have blame and you screwed up and it's irrecoverable or not because of the mistakes you made. This right now is not your fault. You're not to blame. You've done nothing wrong. Everybody's in the same position. In the UK today, Debenhams and Kath Kitson have gone broke. Topshop, I think, have already gone broke. Um, you know, these are huge businesses run by really, really smart people, and they're just dead in the water. You know, that, that's it. They're gone. They're done. And their suppliers are now going to be going, how do I, I can't even get my cash flow to supply them because I, there's no supply anymore. So there's going to be ripple effects through to them as well. So it's not a case of getting beaten up and emotional. It's a case of going, all right, it's game time. There's a, this is a very bad cultural reference for anyone in the call, but there's a, 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 foot, a soccer player in the UK, historical, I think he's passed away now, called George Best. And he once tackled somebody on his own team to take the ball from them so he could score. Um, now, unfortunately, he was an alcoholic, drug addict, and all sorts of other stuff, you know, horrible gambler, womanizer. So he never reached his potential that he could. But he's still regarded as one of the world's greats, but he never reached his potential. But the phrase I love from him is when he was asked afterwards, why did you tackle your own player? He went, winners want the ball. So if, are you a winner or not? If you're listening to this and you run a business, are you a winner or are you a loser? Right? There is no space for compassion in this space. In our relationship calls, and our spirituality calls, that's a whole different world. But you're not going to get compassion from me on the business call because you have to decide to step up and win. And if you don't make that decision, if you're not willing to go, I am going to give this everything I have, then just stop now. Save yourself the heartache of trying to work it out. Do not go into this, excuse my language, half assed You have to literally be willing to go, right, okay, what do I strip back? What do I remove? Who am I not going to pay? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? Okay, here's my plan. Away I go. And if you do that, it can work. I love that. Thank you so much, Peter. And I love that. Um, so for some of us, so you, you take the time to just take this exercise, do those four steps, write it down, cross it out and do it in yourself. For somebody like me, what I love about these calls and being here is being able to ask you or ask the, um, we have about 26 people in our team that can support you and that can really come. So come to hackmankind.com if you're watching us on Facebook, I see here. And Adam's on Facebook and I'm watching the comments. Adam's saying, winners want the ball. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I love that. I love that. Um, and it, it's true that we can come and then ask you or ask other uh, angels and support on getting ideas saying, this is what I do. And that's exactly what Karen has just done. So thank you so much, Karen, for putting it in the comments. So Karen says, um, so in this new thought process, I sell comfort, peace of mind, connections, collaborations between like-minded parents. This is a start. I like the process. What are your thoughts on that? I would start by getting, um, you, the thing with parents is it's an insanely viral audience. You've got a great audience in parents because they're not competing with each other. So we have clients that are like support salespeople, for example. Now salespeople to some degree are competing with each other if they're in the same industry. Um, so it's kind of hard to get any kind of virility with parents. It's absolutely fantastic because any parent knows nine other parents normally. 
Um, so if you give them something great, they'll move on from it. To me, that's as simple as you start that with a, a WhatsApp group or a Facebook group and you bring those people in and you keep reinforcing your mission, your vision and your values until you get like-minded people coming together. And what you're after is that inflection point or as Malcolm Gladwell calls it, the tipping point where you start seeing people talking to other people. And that's, that's where you're getting really, really good. And then reminding them to share. <laughs> Right, so you know, let's refer back to Hack Mankind because I think it's a really useful exercise to critique yourself as much as you critique others. So the first week of this, I don't think we had it right. And you and I have discussed that and a lot of the team have discussed that. I don't think we had it right. I think that I made some, some mistakes. One of those mistakes was an assumption that the, the chat system we put in place would get the traction that we thought it would and it didn't, so it's gone. Right, so simple as that, it's gone. We'll bring that back in play later on when we do have that audience. Then we were like, well, we're not seeing the sharing volume that we wanted. So we introduced the, call, the earlier call between you and I uh, eight. So that we now have that point for people to understand what it is we're doing in a really easy way. And this is a great example of just iterate without ego or emotion. You know, what are the challenges that we need to face? What are the things that we haven't communicated properly? What are the things we have communicated properly? And just iterate. And one of the great things about this current climate that we're in is the level of your execution is, is excused to some degree. So if you go back three, four months ago, everybody, if you talked to me three, four months ago and said, I want to launch a community for parents, I would be looking at $100,000 worth of, of build for you. I'd be trying to find developers and UI experts, product designers, because in, in a growth market, anybody can succeed. I mean, literally, you can fall over onto your face into success when the world is expanding. It's very hard to actually screw fail if the world is expanding, because all you've got to do is kind of stand still and you'll naturally expand, right? That's a little bit of an overstatement, but you kind of get what I mean. But when the world's contracting, and certainly the speed it has done, you're allowed to get it wrong because everybody's life is upside down you know kids are at home the partners are there this is happening that's happening everybody's life is topsy-turvy so your level of execution does not need to be perfect if and this is always true at least for the last 20 30 years i guess that i've been working authenticity is unassailable that is my number one piece of advice i think probably to any person in business if you run a business and you're authentic, it doesn't, and you can be like authentic in a good way or a bad way, but as long as you're actually yourself and 110% of yourself, people that are attracted to that or people that agree with your philosophy and people that understand your message will come on board. And people that don't agree will, will run away, which is fantastic. Marketing is about pulling people towards you that agree with you and actively pushing people away that don't agree with you you don't want to support and serve those people because they don't agree with you they're in, inherently expensive to try and persuade someone that doesn't agree with you to agree with you so whatever it is you're doing whether it's in this time period now or in six months time or a year or five or ten be authentic just just be yourself and let the company that you you grow or run be an extension of that authenticity because that's where you get true connection with people. And if you have true connection with people, you have their trust. If you have their trust and you have an, a, a service or a product that's worthwhile, then you, can, then you can exchange money for it. But trust is built on authenticity. It's built on knowing somebody. You don't have to like somebody to trust them. True, 100%. See, so yeah, I would just say in the case of, of building a community and empowering those values, start with a test bed of the smallest possible tech build you can do. So that's either a Facebook group or a WhatsApp group or something like that and say, right, let's all get in here. This is what it is. This is how we're doing this. I'm going to change it regularly as we get it all right and wrong. Hey, my example. Um, if you've got more technical skills, fantastic. You can look into something more complex, but it's the ability. I think I can't remember who coined this phrase, but fail fast and fail often. And don't hold on to your failures. Just get, the cheapest way possible to do what the thing you want to do is so you can see if you are right. And if you are right, then build on it. And if you are wrong, take a step back 
and do that bit again. And then when that bit's right, build on that. And eventually you'll end up with something amazing. I love that. Thank you so much. And Peter, what I take away is, is so if you're right now in a business that is struggling and you need to pivot, right? We need to turn left and right. I love how you say it's not ups and downs. It's just turn left and right. It's just a shift. It's a pivot. And um, if you can, and if you're, you're open to it, just get down and start looking at number one, what the, accepting the fact that we're all in a different world right now acknowledging the fact that we're in a different world and to to do an inventory of what we actually have what are our assets what are what do we what do we have right in our arsenal and then what are the customer needs that we are fulfilling what do they actually want what do they desire and their their could have shifted too right uh, yeah. yeah because their world is different too and then uh, uh, see how they can um, serve those needs and then what i love what you say another big takeaway um, that you mentioned is if you're feeling stuck, take this time. It's not going to end tomorrow, right? This isn't going to go away tomorrow. You have a couple of days. If you need to, you know, spend time with family, if you can't go outside, just spend a little self-love, a little self, you know, um, a little break to then come back and see it with fresh, uh, fresh eyes. You said, no, it was soft eyes, soft eyes, <laughs> yeah. soft eyes. The other thing I'd say, there's two other pieces of detail from what, when you repeat it back, there's some detail in it that's important, I think. When you do that inventory, when I say what is an asset, right, there, there are hundreds of assets that normally, again, in a growth market, you don't even pay attention to. So let's, again, let's take Hack Mankind. What's one of the assets? I'm willing to look stupid on video. That is an asset. Right? Some people aren't willing to do video. And if you're not willing to do video, that's cool. Gary V has a, a lot of Gary Venture has a lot of great content on social media. And one of his really kind of foundation piece of advice is if you're comfortable on video, get on video. And if you're not comfortable on video, get on audio. If you're not comfortable on audio, get on text, you know, you know, the written word. But find the one you're comfortable with and wherever it is, double down on it and just go for that. Don't try and do it if you're not comfortable with it. You don't have to be good at it, you just have to be comfortable with it. So that's really important, I think, in terms of when you talk about doing the inventory. There are dozens and dozens of things that normally you would discount. Get it all down because you need to find maximum value from all of those things. One of the things we didn't talk about, which I also think is important, is suppliers. If you're running a business right now and you haven't called every single supplier you have and say, what, what, price, what is the best price you can offer me right now? How can we cut a deal here? What if we reduce my electricity bill by 50% for the next six months, and then we increase it by 20% for life when I sign a five-year contract. Right? You have to go and ask for flexibility with everybody you have. So where the government has allowed for staff and furloughing, whatever, that's fantastic. But if you're planning to keep your staff on, I would have a conversation with them. In fact, I've had that conversation internally and gone, there could be two choices here. Choice one, we all agreed to take a pay cut, Choice two, I have to look at some other measures which I don't think some of you are going to like as much. I'm sorry if you find that offensive, but that's the reality of where we are. I need to bring all of these numbers down as low as I can. Um, and for when you see people that have done like mass layoffs, I think that if you were to go to their boss and say, did you offer everybody the opportunity to take a, a, a highly reduced package for the next six months? Because if you didn't, why have you taken that choice away from them? Now you can, and I know that every country has different legal things with unions and staffing, et cetera. So I'm not saying this advice works everywhere, but it's a mentality. It's looking at every single deal that you signed in the good days and going, okay, can I still honor this? Because I would think that your photocopier supplier would rather keep 50% of your money than you go broke in three months time. Yeah. But have the courage to have the conversation and just reach out to every single person you know, on your out column in your finances and go, we need to talk about this. And no because ego. I love what you're talking about and that energy. And I know that you talk about it all the time. It's like there's no ego. There's no emotion to it. It's very, it, it's it. Because some people might feel embarrassed to have to ask for it or, or, or have that ego. It's like, oh, you know, I'd rather not ask. Let's talk about the people that are embarrassed. I want you to say the sentence. Hi, I'm sorry there was a worldwide pandemic that started in a province in China. I really apologize for that. P.S. Can I talk about my bill with you? Right? Put it in the context. Right? 
And that's why I said, if you go back a year and you have run your business badly and your business is failing, then maybe you should be embarrassed or maybe you should have an issue with it. I still don't think you should personally, because even being willing to run your own business, you deserve the respect of anybody and everybody in this world. Because it is a, it is not the glamour that people make it out to be. It is very hard and very lonely. So anybody that's even trying, I think you deserve the credits. But in this environment right now, what do you have to be embarrassed about? I mean, this is not of your making. So if you're not, especially if you employ people, and this is something I used to use for myself whenever I had a point that I couldn't get past. I used to look around my office and I used to look at people and go, I'm responsible for your roof, your food, your kids the least I can do is give you my best. I might not make it, I might not succeed, but you've trusted me. And that trust means something to me, so I'm gonna repay that by doing everything I can do on your behalf. And that also goes in the hard world when you do have to fire someone or lay somebody off, because if you've got 20 employees, you, you have to look after 19 of 20 if you can. But I still say go back to everybody and offer and, and be open and give them a level playing field and see what what comes from it but yeah people that are embarrassed right now I, I i mean if you can tell me why i'd be fascinated why somebody has any logical i know and i know embarrassment isn't a logical thing and that's why i'm just reinforcing it you know when um i was running a business in dubai um when 9 11 happened and eight out of ten people went home within 40 days so dubai literally had only two out of ten people were left in the country and I think it's 18% of the population are locals to that country. So basically, the, the foreign nationals like myself, only 2% stayed. I mean, everybody went home. Nobody was in the Middle East. All the big American companies and British companies recalled their staff because their insurance wouldn't cover a wartime footing. Um, and most people then went, well, there's no business left, so we're going to go home. Dubai's economy is all tourism. Um, and we, we didn't succeed that one because I took the wrong advice. I didn't take my own advice from my 40 year old self. Um, but yeah, we were incredibly open with people and it was, and just saying that this is where we are. This is what we've got to do. Um, we had 20, 28 people. Um, and it was, it was horrible and it was a horrible three months because we didn't see, or I didn't see, not we, I didn't see we were in a different world. I didn't go through this exercise that I'm explaining because if you if we'd sat and done our inventory and we looked at our customers half of our customers were um, royal families and royal courts so we had shopping centers and hotels that were owned by um, royalty in the Middle East they're not going anywhere they're staying there their business might be you know dead and buried for a year or two but they don't care if I'd gone back to each of them and said I need your help to stay in business, I'm being totally frank with you. So what I'd like to do to make that fair and amicable is I'd like to reduce your bill by 50% if you re-sign now for five years. So I'll give you half price, on, and, but you stay with me, you help me, and I'll make sure that you're repaid over the long, long term. So what you're doing there is pulling money forwards, uh, pulling money into the, into the present from the future, which is something that hotels and airlines need to do right now. Um, and if I'd done that, if I'd gone back to each of my customers and looked at my assets, my assets included, you know, royal family customers. That's fantastic. Other people would have would, would bent me over for that. It was amazing. But instead, I just saw my loss. I saw the fact that the car hire company that I had a great retainer with had shut down. I saw that the fact that the cruise company I worked with had sent their cruise ship home. That, you know, I just saw all the things I'd lost. And yeah, we went from 3.5 million retained revenue per year to 52,000 retained revenue per year in 48 hours. So there was a lot of loss, you know, and again, 9-11, just like this, the human tragedy that people go through matters far more. But my lens sitting there was I had, I was 24. I started the business when I was 18. I started it with zero. I built it up. I had 28 members of staff. I was, you know, I lived in this great villa. I had a driver. Everyone was living, I was living a total playboy life. I didn't save a penny note to self in good time to save money um, and suddenly I had nothing um, and you fast forward from that September to January and I come home with a suitcase in one hand a briefcase in the other because that was all that was left um, and I wish 
I had been able to give myself that advice that I'm giving people now of just take a take a breath. Yes, everything looks very, very scary, but you have a bunch of assets. You've spent a whole bunch of money developing a bunch of assets. You have an audience. You have a set of expertise. How do you put this back together? Uh, it might not look like the same revenue that you were doing before. It might look like more, to be totally honest, or it might look like less, but you'll survive if you do that. I love that. I love that. And um, if anybody has questions, please, please put it on the comments. If you're on the uh, membership um, webinar or even on um, on Facebook. And in the meantime, when the questions are coming on, um, I have a question is if looking at um, the different uh, I mean, I'm sure people have asked you for advice. What has been one of the most common or the most common asked questions that you've had um, in the past couple of weeks that you would like to share? Easy. Um, the, the most common thing I hear is fear. And the most common piece of advice is how do I do this online? And the, we have all been moving, or most businesses that have a sense of the future have been moving to some form of digital delivery over time anyway. Um, so that process is just exacerbated for people as they're coming up. And my first question is always, well, again, to just go through that process we've just gone through of, well, what is it your customers are actually buying? Let's, let's start with that. And, and getting back to that understanding, because what you might build right now might not look like what you were doing. You might go from being a company that is a product or service company, or a product company, let's say that, you sell X, Y, Z thing, and the way you sell it can no longer be sold in the way you used to sell it. Well, you should probably become a service company, or you should probably look to strike finance deals with people where you say, okay, you know, your average spend over the last X years was this. Cool. So we know that when we come out of this, your average spend is going to look roughly like this. That's okay. Our profit margin was this. So why not carry on paying us that as a monthly fee right now? So there's a company that um, I met a couple of years ago and they sold, this is something um, that every can look into is Jay Abraham um, about the different business models that exist. There's something along the lines of 25 or 30 different business models that exist. Um, and every single one of them can apply to almost every single business if you're creative enough. So the, my perfect example of this is if you run a, a lemonade stand um, and I run a lemonade stand, what will happen is we will both homogenize our product, our service, and our price to the lowest price point and the same quality. So I, to explain that, as I make an innovation, mm -hmm. so I find a way to get more lemon juice out of a lemon, you will follow that innovation. You'll copy me because you go, well, why would I want to I'll do that as well? So I do that. And then you discover a better way to market your lemonade to people. So you change it to pink flyers, not white flyers. And I see that you're now doing more business. So I now do colored flyers as well. So over a period of time, what will happen is these two businesses will become, in quotes, perfect. They'll become the most efficient version they can whilst they're selling lemonade for 90 cents a cup. Then what happens is Bob comes in and opens up another lemonade stand. And Bob says, you can have as much lemonade as you want from me every month for $9.99. And you and I look at each other and go, crap. Now, all the business has gone to Bob now. Now, he's taken all of our innovations that we've done, all of our expertise in marketing. He hasn't invested a penny in them. He hasn't done any testing. He hasn't hired a marketing manager or a product guy. He's just come in, copied what we do, and just changed the business model to a better, more efficient business model. Now, this is the interesting period. Bob now has a three month window, and I'm using the three months as, a, as an example, to gain huge market share over you and I. Because you and I are scrambling to work out how we reverse, you know, we've got to pay our employees differently. We were buying cups in that way. All of our decisions were all around the business model that we were operating under. And suddenly, we now need to swap to a totally different business model. Our account system doesn't work on subscriptions. It works on a per unit basis. All the things that we would have to fix to do it, in that time, Bob is now getting customer loyalty and chipping away at our market 
of a dog. Now, if Bob's smart, what happens is you and I then start doing that, and then he goes, okay, right, you're doing that now, so what am I gonna do? Uh, I'm gonna do, um, I'll start doing loyalty cards, so every time you buy a lemonade from me at 9.99, I'm gonna give you a friend for $5. And we're like, we don't even have loyalty systems. Right? So each time you do these shifts in your business model, you gain yourself uh, like a clear air for three, for 30, 60, 90 days. And it's there that you make these massive differences in, in the expectation of a customer. And you see that again in Netflix blockbuster, iPhone. You know, the iPhone is the greatest example of that. They just decided to go, okay, we're doing all this totally differently. We're going to persuade people. They did. And then they get this huge you know, window of opportunity before everybody catches up and starts doing something very similar. Um, Uber, we were talking about that the other day. You know, Uber and Lyft and Rideshare, they're all the same service, you know, essentially. And when you get into an Uber, you often see they've got both apps. But one is the market leader because they just totally revolutionize the way that they approach that business and the business plan. It's such a key thing. Um, and that's where you can look across everything. So yeah, the, the company I met a couple of years ago was a, uh, a bed manufacturer. They did mattresses. And it's a really high-end mattress. It's like $6,000 or 16000 I mean, it's huge. I mean, it's like ridiculously expensive. Um, and like they're, they're in like the Berger, they're like the best in the world. It's coming called Dipsiana. Um, and they were evaluating whether they could rent you a mattress. And I was like, that's really silly. And they went, oh, hang on a second, is it? I mean, is anyone going to spend 6000 And then they went, well, what? then what they looked at doing was maybe selling them to hotels and then selling refurbed versions of it through to other people. So you could get a Duxiana like reduction. So it still goes through a hundred checks and et cetera. But I've heard of the used car market. I've never heard of a used mattress market. It's a fascinating thing. I'm not saying they will, will or won't be successful with it, but the fact that someone as prosaic as a mattress provider is willing to think about, can we rent a mattress to people? Can we get you to pay for it on a finance agreement? Like finance, that's a different model. Financing something is a different model from just an outright sale. So they were looking at banks to finance. So you could literally pay for your mattress by the month. Yeah, and the biggest examples right now in, in the world of mattresses, I don't know what the American brand is, but in the UK we have Emma, Casper, these mattresses in a box. Yes. Mm -hmm. like, that is a different, you know, somebody literally went, you know what, we can, we can do this for 90 bucks and we can deliver it in a box. Yeah, and you always see just social media advertising. They don't even have stores. So now every other manufacturer of mattresses is scrambling to go, okay, how do we do that? I mean, these guys are literally delivering it, not on trucks, not on pallets. You know, they're literally just going, yeah, I have a mattress, you can have it tomorrow. Next day delivery on a mattress, 99 euros. I don't know if they're any good or not, or I, you know, I think people have had them kind of say they're cool, but just fascinating the amount of different varieties and ways you can skin something and put it back together you know, airlines are a great example of people that are very good at repackaging a product you know, anyone over the age of 35 will remember when you bought an airline ticket and that was the end of the deal like you spent your 200 dollars or your two thousand dollars and you got a ticket you're like fantastic that's it nowadays you you spend <laughs> yeah you see it's true right nowadays you spend the same money Russell, what about this? <laughs> I was like, like, okay, you know, step one of 18. Do you want this? Do you want your meal served before other people? Do you want to sit close to the front or the back? Like that makes a difference. You're going to arrive at the same time. You're all going to get off together. It makes zero difference whatsoever. And yet I still do it. Do you want to pay to board earlier? Again, what difference does that make? You know, they, they have sliced their product. And what they did at the beginning was they reduced the price. So if you got it like a thousand dollar fare, they made it so that the the fare itself was six hundred dollars and the extras then added back up to the money. Now the reason or one of the reasons they did this originally was the tax. Because the tax of the of the the airfare has you know, a huge amount of taxes from the airports from the governments. Whereas the tax for early boarding is zero. So all they did originally was shift it around so they made more profit with tax, which was genius. But then what they did was they started creeping up the, the, the price of the airfare. So now they're now earning more money from you than they ever were because they just 
repackage their product. This is something that almost anybody can do right now. If you have a product and you have anything bundled to that product, look at it and look at the cost of it versus the value of it. Because there's certain things that you can add on to a bundle that cost you very little, but offer a lot of value. So uh, warranties, guarantees, that's a good place to put it. Servicing packages. You know, how much money does Apple make from Apple Care in comparison to the sale of the phone? Uh, I, I, would, I would shudder to see the difference. And Apple, again, a genius company at this. That's the, the App Store, iTunes, all these things are just you know, ancillary, ancillary add-ons, really. The phone is almost irrelevant now to them in terms of their revenue in comparison to the App Store and iTunes. So first of all, what can you add on to make your product more valuable without increasing your cost by the same amount of value? So you want to add on minimal cost and maximum value. Or the other way around, what do you already have bundled with your product that costs you where the value isn't perceived? So, for example, a good example of that is people that do reports every week. So you run into this when you get a marketing agency. Or you, I'll report every week on your SEO or your digital marketing or this or this or this. Well, are, are your customers actually reading the report every week, really? Do you, if it costs you, if it's automated, great. But if it costs you, you can probably do it once a month, not once a week. And then what you can do, the magic of it, is once you move it to once a month, you can then charge them to get it once a week. So you're giving them exactly the same product and service in their value. You're giving them exactly the same thing. But instead of giving the report every week, you move the report to every month. And then a couple of months later, you start offering great news. We now do reports by the week for only an extra $25. You, there might be a bit of weight between a couple of months, but it's just packaging and repackaging your product. So look at again, and that comes back to understanding the value and what that person is buying so you can repackage it. Life insurance, I don't know. Can you do a, a review every year, a paid review every year? You're already paying this for life insurance. Can we do a review with you every year for $50 to make sure it's still the right product and right fit for your family? If you buy that now, we'll reduce it for life to $35. It, it's an extra $35 that has zero cost applied to it right now that you're pulling in from the future. In almost every single instance, you can find a different way to package a product. I love Sorry, that. So much value. And hi, Jeff. Um, so Jeff, um, that I met in Miami, uh, just um, commented on the Facebook, um, just signed up. So signed up for Hack Mankind. Welcome, welcome. Um, Love the program so far and the idea, uh, the ideas of um, it's kind of nourishing content in this challenging time for us all. So thank you so much, Jeff. I'm looking forward to seeing you on all our calls. We have calls every day um, on different topics. So if you have any specific questions, we've got um, a few minutes left on this call. If you have any specific questions for Peter, any support that you need, please write it on the comments and I'm sure we can help and you. if anybody does ask questions when we do these lives i commit that i'll answer them within 48 hours if it's in the comments or how we can support each other because we're not the panel calls that we're doing now strictly speaking aren't supposed to be on live i'm cheating because well i'm the founder so i can do what i like right so we're putting some of these on live so that you can all see what we do so it's only fair if people ask comments afterwards we will make sure we answer them so if you don't ask them verbally that's fine if you consider something now, but literally, if you are running a business and you don't have a very, very clear path of what you're going to do in this situation, please ask us. That is exactly why we're here. Right? We're not here, you know, we want to give the grandiose stuff. And yes, I obviously like the sound of my own voice to some degree, but what I really like is watching people, that moment of eureka when people go, oh, okay, I can see a route forwards. Um, it's a really... It's a really humbling and inspiring moment for me when I see people go, when they take a breath, when they take that first breath. And again, that's in any subject, whether it's relationship or children or legal, when, when you finally see their shoulders sag and they go, okay, I can see a path. That's the moment that I think all of us, I kind of speak for all of us here, I hope, but all of us live for, where we go, yes, amazing. Everything I've done, all my pain, all my problems, all my learnings, all my growth has given this person this moment. That's a phenomenal moment. And it's kind of important in those last few minutes to, to iterate. 
I'm telling you this, this, these piece of advice from a point of, I have done it the other way and it didn't work. So I've been through the dot-com boom and bust of, you know, the early noughties where you just saw all of the dot-com companies without a viable business model disappear. Now, there, there wasn't a bubble and a burst. What it was was just the companies that didn't deserve to be in business were no longer in business. The people with good business models stayed. I was in Dubai for 9-11 where my, my business went from three and a half million to $50,000 turnover almost overnight. And I played it wrong. I was in a state of fear and apprehension. I didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't survive that because of it. I survived four months before I had to come home. I was in the 2008, 2012 um, recession, running my own agency. We just signed our largest marquee client with hideous payment terms. And we didn't do that right either. And we lost that. So don't listen to me because I not because I can prove to you that I've done it right. Listen to me because I've tried all the other approaches and they don't work. They simply don't work. Now is the time. If you get this basic foundation that I've just said done, now is the time you can hire people for 50% of their market value. I mean, it, it's going to be crazy. You walk forward six months from now, people that are on 60,000 will start accepting 30. Right. If you can position yourself in strength, you can, you, can, you can hire great stuff. And please don't underpay them. I'm just saying the whole market is going to come down. You'll be able to buy businesses that you couldn't afford to buy. You'll be able to buy, you know, the amount of, again, I use this example a bit too often, maybe, the amount of photocopiers that are going to be up for auction at like $50 because you know, that company went bankrupt. You, if you can position yourself right now, your access to buy underappreciated resources and, and, and companies, your ability to employ people, you're going to be in such a strong position to serve you, your business, and your community. And as I said, I don't want anybody to screw anybody for salary, but you know, salaries were, were all going up, and, and that isn't going to happen anymore. Everybody's going to come back down. Um, I feel very, very sorry personally for university graduates. I think they're going to have a really tough time because they're going to be competing with people 15 years older than or 20 years older than they've got experience in the job that are maybe willing to take the same money. And that's going to be a really interesting dynamic to see what happens. And, but again, they just need to lean into their soft skills and they can be okay as well. So yeah, I would absolutely, if you can see this as a point of opportunity, not a point of scarcity, and you can go, great, I can remodel this, I can make this more efficient, and I'm going to replan how I go out to my market. What you're left with on the other side of that is you know is kind of a winner takes it all type type world all of those restaurants that go out of business people are still going to eat out in six months so your market share if you come through this other side can be humongous it's a great word humongous <laughs> i love that thank you so much peter we're coming um to the end of the hour and our call was so much content so much value thank you so much and i really Oops. appreciate the different examples that you've been giving. I think it clarifies a lot in terms of um, getting that creativity going. And what I really love um, personally as well is getting that mindset. I think it's a really a mindset sh a shift, mm -hmm. not getting overwhelmed by fear, understanding that fear is really not gonna be taking us there. Looking, And it doesn't just doesn't work. It's, it's, there are things we can control and things we can't control. And it's looking at what we can control and just go forward from there taking action. action. So um, as always, as uh, Peter mentioned, normally these calls aren't on Facebook Live. So thank you so much for having this call on live. We'll have a few uh, once in a while available for now since we're, you know, we've just launched Hack Mankind for, um, for the past, not even a week. Uh, always a lifetime free access for any first responders, nurses, doctors, teachers, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some categories. <laughs> doctors, nurses, EMTs, teachers, police officers, and firefighters. There you go. Um, lifetime free access. So if you are, and if you did sign up, uh, just send us a picture of your ID to support at hackmankind.com. Is that what it is? 
support at hackmackkai.com and we will give you free access for life. So please share, share, share this video on Facebook as well. Um, have We just want to build a huge community where we will support not only like on this call around business, we also have panelists on relationship, on legal advice, as well as um, how to handle children at this moment, right? Education and kids, uh, health. We have a every single day an incredible coach going guiding us through some really cool, fun exercises, short exercises that we can do to take care of our bodies during this time and um, in terms of nutrition too. Am I forgetting? Um, oh, spirituality as well and um, my um, mindset and uh, positivity. So motivation more motivation so as well as as well as our group support calls it's like we're, we have so much content that's true every day we have at least three calls at least if not more four you, now we have four now if you have something about fear or misinformation that we're not doing then we'll just start doing it it's really that simple because it's about helping out the frontline responders that are willing to walk into emergency rooms for us right now and do stuff for the world that i think we owe them a debt of gratitude and it's about helping people not live in fear seeing opportunity where they were previously seeing adversity and gaining access to quality information and quality resources so if there's something we're doing we're not doing in that space we'll probably start doing it i love that thank you so much peter peter our founder pleasure. thank you so much to everybody that joined. and on our next calls bye see you soon bye bye